All right, here we are for another journal club with Vestibular First. Welcome everyone. And I'd like to especially welcome our very special guest tonight, Dr. Alan Desmond. He's an audiologist and I'm gonna let him continue to introduce himself from here. Okay, well, thank you, Helene, for having me on. This is uh, hopefully gonna be an uh, interesting uh, experience for, for me and hopefully a few others. Um, so uh, at, at this point in my career, I'm doing mostly teaching. I'm at Wake Forest University, I'm teaching the medical school. Um, I started off in private practice um, and I ran a uh, you know, basic private practice vestibular clinic for 32 years um, and then just decided to uh, sort of move into academia, opportunity presented itself. Um, so I, I do, you know, have a short story about how I got into vestibular uh, management. Um, like most audiologists, when I got out of school, I went into private practice. I uh, uh, formed a partnership with two young ENT guys, and it was a great partnership. We stayed partners for 32 years. Um, and, I, and I did what most audiologists do. I uh, tested hearing. I sold hearing aids. Uh, it went very well. Um, and I started off doing VNGs, and this was before epilee maneuvers. This was before we had, we only had uh, cough and cooksey exercise. We didn't have anything else. <laughs> and I was really busy testing hearing and fitting hearing aids, and I was trying to struggle to find time to do VNGs. So I just stopped, well, they were ENGs at the time, literal cut and paste, literally take pieces of paper, cut them with scissors and put glue on the back of them and paste them on paper. Um, so very time consuming and, and not honestly a lot of positive impact on the patient. So I just sort of abandoned it. And about 10 years into my career, uh, a good friend of mine comes into my office, um, 30 something woman. Um, she was a very athletic, very educated. And she comes in saying, I'm having these episodes of vertigo. They're terrible. When I tilt my head, I spin, I've been throwing up. I can't do anything. What is this? And, and of course, at that time, I said, well, gee, I don't know, but it, but it sounds awful. Um, so I didn't really have anything to offer her. So I sent her to Johns Hopkins. And uh, she calls me a couple of days later and says, you know, I went up here for the vertigo and they did this thing and I'm completely better. And I thought, what magic are, are they weaving at Johns Hopkins? <laughs> so, uh, so I called up and I don't remember who I talked to, but I, but I said, um, you know, what is it that you did? I've never heard of such a thing. And they told me about this guy, Epley, and this maneuver. Um, so I learned uh, where he was doing his next presentation, which was a big conference out in Denver in, I think, 91. Um, and I went to that conference. And at that time, there was a lot of skepticism about what he was preaching. Um, but it made sense to me. And, uh, you know, I came back and started trying it. And, you know, my partners were a little skeptical despite the fact that they had known me for 10 years, um, the you know, competing ENT and neurology folks thought it was voodoo and publicly <laughs> said so. So put up with a little bit of that. Um, but it obviously worked and there was a great demand for it. So over the following you know, five to 10 years, I just couldn't keep up with the demand. And as I got into more than just doing BPPV, uh, I started adding pieces one by one. I added a platform. I added a rotary chair. I added you know, active head rotation at the time. So I ended up uh, you know, having a pretty full service vestibular lab, but it took you know, 10 to 15 years to grow it to the point that I was able to you know, handle most of what came in the door. That's awesome. <laughs> well, we appreciate your experience that you bring to this discussion uh, that we're about to have today, which we're going to shift right into here. And uh, the article that uh, had been selected for tonight's discussion is entitled Current Concepts in Acute Vestibular Syndrome and Video Oculography. And it's going to bring up some great opportunities for us to discuss some dis different aspects of uh, kind of uh, vestibular care, technology in vestibular care, and so forth. So we're looking forward to getting into this. So just to get everyone on the same page, I always like to do this, just to get uh, those who are maybe less familiar, especially with the vestibular system. Uh, it's an inner ear balance sensor. There it is living amongst our hearing structures. I like to call them neighbors. Um, and so that is in our inner ear. You can't see it. If you were to look inside the ear, you would not see it because it is blocked by other structures, such as hopefully an intact eardrum. And, um, 
We know that in the instance of acute vestibular syndrome, what could be going wrong is actually many things. So we're going to talk about that first here. So in the article that we're discussing tonight, uh, they describe acute vestibular syndrome as a continuous state of dizziness for more than 24 hours, which includes nystagmus, which is kind of a rhythmic beating in the eye. It's involuntary um, and usually a sign of pathology, although there are some normal physiologic nystagmuses out there. Uh, gait disturbance, nausea, vomiting, and motion intolerance. And what they know is when we do a, a test to look at the brain, uh, such as an MRI, um, and it's a new stroke, um, you can you know, miss that in the kind of first 24 or 48 hours. Um, and the numbers are listed there on what could be missed. 20 to 50% is in the literature. So this acute vestibular system is this syndrome, this is a, a symptom issue. I'm coming in, I'm having, you know, this horrible, you know, they sometimes call it vestibular crisis, this kind of, <laughs> you know, kind of aspect of, of various symptoms that are, are not pleasant. Um, but the causation, you know, can be a few different uh, medical conditions. One is what we call brain issues, central issues. The brain is the center uh, directing us, right? So that could be a stroke, could be a migraine, um, and some other conditions we'll get to shortly. It could be an issue with the inner ear. So I mentioned the vestibular system, told you all about that. Um, so one thing could be an inflammation of the inner ear, which we call vestibular neuritis, specifically the nerve that comes from that vestibular structure. Um, it could be an episode of what they call Meniere's disease, which is not a very well understood <laughs> um, causation, but it's kind of this, what I'll call inflammation of the inner ear, for lack of a better term, swelling, um, high drops, they call it sometimes, etc. Could be trauma, so someone actually hits you hard enough on the side of the head to damage the inner ear structures, um, or you're in a car accident, things like that, right? So, um, you know, we really have to do our differential diagnosis, and this is kind of this process where we're trying to sort out, you know, what's the cause of these symptoms. Um, so I know you've worked in the ER some, Dr. Desmond. Can you tell us a little bit about your first or subsequent encounters, any notable encounters of someone with AVS? Sure. Um, so it, when I was in private practice, I was in a small town, small medical community. We all knew each other uh, socially. Um, and so you know, one of my offices was attached to the hospital and it wouldn't be terribly unusual for them to call me and say, hey, I have a, a patient with acute vertigo. Can you come down here and tell me what you think? Um, and, you know, unofficial. I never actually officially saw that patient, but... Um, and, uh, and I actually had slots in my schedule for acute vertigo where they could send them over the same day. Um, now that I'm at a university medical center, we don't really do that. Um, one of the neurotologists when I, uh, when I started at Wake seven years ago, um, he was very insistent that that is a primary care ER doctor's job to determine if acute vertigo is a stroke or a, uh, a, you know, a peripheral vestibular issue. Um, so we don't really do that now. Um, you know, my schedule is such that people can't get in uh, while they're still in the acute phase very easily. Um, so I don't have a lot of recent experience with it. Um, I do have a lot of experience with seeing the outcome of patients mm -hmm. that are evaluated in the ER um, for acute vestibular syndrome. Um, it's often not recognized as acute vestibular syndrome. It's often diagnosed as something other than that. And we see them after they've gone from acute to chronic. Um, but um, they usually have spent a month or two being treated for the wrong thing. What's an example of something that, you know, might be kind of mislabeled uh, that when it was really AVS, but they enabled it something yeah. else? What else might they call it? Well, we very rarely see any notation of nystagmus. And when we do see a notation of nystagmus, we see things like, nystagmus left eye, nystagmus right eye, you know, no mention of direction, no mention of direction changing. Right. Um, and then we see a uh, patient had vertigo and nystagmus noted on Dix Hall Pike testing. So it's BPPV. And so we, and I've seen this, this is routine. This is not unusual. Right. This is routine. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, part of my job is to teach, um, you know, the ENT residents who do some of these acute vertigo consults, but also some of the primary care residents. I don't have access to the ER residents, unfortunately. Um, 
is to teach them that it's only a positive Dix Hall pike if there are no nystagmus and if there's no vertigo before you lay them down. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it's sort of the pendulum has swung to where, you know, 20 years ago, you know, nobody had BPPV, nobody knew what it was, and now everybody has BPPV. Um, and, and, you know, the good news is sometimes they're right. Um, but um, we don't see that the exams that are going on in the ER are, are you know, following the recommended protocols. They're not really looking for spontaneous nystagmus. They're not doing head impulse testing. Um, you know, I had one a uh, few weeks ago uh, that I actually use. We do a monthly case conference with the, with the ENT residents. And this is the case I submitted where they called in a neurologist for acute vestibular syndrome. And uh, the neurologist did, says, you know, hints, uh, positive, uh, positive catch-up saccades, unidirectional nystagmus, and sent them for repositioning. Um, so so they, were, they were half right. I mean, <laughs> they did their job in determining that this doesn't look like a stroke, um, but they didn't take the next step into, well, which inner ear problem does this sound like to me? Um, and thought, you know, the person says they get worse when they lay down, so sent them to PT, who did a couple of weeks of repositioning. Um, and so by the time they got to me, you know, it had sort of turned into the chronic phase. Right. And there's nothing worse. I just had a patient today come in eagerly hoping for repositioning because a doctor suggested that her vertigo might be BBBV. Um, and her neighbor had said how great I was. But um, <laughs> I don't know if I totally agree, but, you know, I appreciated the compliment. At any rate, uh, yeah, she has all the signs to me and symptoms uh, and fits the criteria for vestibular migraine. Um, and so, you know, I told her, look, you may have had BBV at some point. I can only tell you don't have it today. Um, and then we talked about next steps, but you know, it's, it's a constant education, of course, I think of, you know, I would say clinicians and then patients when they need to be educated on it. Although I'm, I'm a fan of everyone knowing a bit more about the vestibular system, regardless of whether you're a clinician or not, but. Yeah. And, and I have to be cognizant that in the setting that I'm in now, if someone gets the correct diagnosis, the correct treatment, they're probably not seeking an appointment two months down the road. Um, so we're not seeing the ones that it went right. We're seeing the ones that it didn't go right. So, um, you know, right. I, 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 you know uh, I'm not suggesting that it isn't done right a lot. Sure. I'm sure it's done Absolutely. right a lot. But, right. but the, ones that, the ones that don't get uh, evaluated and managed properly end up in our clinic. Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of variables there. Uh, so, you know, I think part of the challenge that all clinicians face for sure, um, is that, you know, we kind of talk about the central peripheral. We just talked about that some a moment ago. Um, you know, but kind of under those umbrellas, there are all kind of all these possible, uh, root causes, I'll call them of these, um, symptoms. Um, so for example, one possible central issue, so affecting the brain we've mentioned is stroke. Um, but another possible issue, it would be multiple sclerosis. So, you know, as we're kind of going through our due diligence, I couldn't say with absolute certainty that if someone came into my clinic and they showed signs of a central vestibular issue that I could say, oh, you definitely have MS or you definitely have a stroke. And that's where our other tools come into play, like imaging, of course, um, blood tests as well to help identify things like certain kinds of um, cancer or autoimmune diseases that could be kind of wrecking havoc in the body, including on the vestibular system, whether that's at the brain level or at the inner ear level or occasionally both. Um, so, you know, I think just being cognizant, I'm not going to read through this list for you all. It's a, lined out very well in the article and a beautiful table as well. Um, but I just want to kind of point out to everybody that, you know, there, there should be at some point for some folks, a multi-step process. <laughs> Sometimes it's immediate and obvious and that's wonderful. I, did all my vestibular tests and everything looked good except my Dix Hall Pike showed definite, you know, patterned <laughs> nystagmus and symptoms that fits posterior canal, BPPV on the right. Wonderful. We treat that. And all those symptoms are now gone and retest. Great. <laughs> right? Those are like, I call it scoop a check, a soup of vanilla, don't waste my time from a <laughs> uh, that movie with, uh, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name. But anyway, the point is, Straightforward cases, right? Those are exciting, at least to get every once in a while. Do you still get some of those, Dr. Desmond? 
Oh, certainly. Yeah. I, I think the thing that um, we probably see most often um, in, in our lab is uh, straight up horizontal canal BPPD. Mm -hmm. um, and, and simply because it's just not on the radar for a lot of people. I mean, posterior canal is on the radar. And so if somebody actually has posterior canal BPPD, they're probably going to be treated with epilene maneuvers. They're probably going to be sent home with epilene maneuvers. They're probably going to get better. Um, but when they don't get better, it, it's, they have a hard time finding someone who can recognize that this is right. a, a variant form of BPV and treat it differently. So to us, that's kind of, that, that's an easy one. I mean, we get, we get your posterior canals once in a while too. We do. Um, and, and those are lots of fun. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I agree with you. You know, it, it is nice to have one where, you know, all the boxes get checked and, you know, you, you can tell the patient what's going to happen next. So yeah, uh, you need a few of those once in a while. Yes, yes. I always say I, I like the mix. I don't want them all to be easy. I like a little challenge as well, uh, especially I think the, probably the more experienced you get, you might feel that way a little bit. I know I do, but uh, yeah, definitely a mix is good. And I'm happy to know that I am putting out a newsletter very soon from Vestibular First, and the topic is indeed on horizontal canal, BBBB. Right. I see it come yeah. up a lot in the Facebook and other social media chats and discussions and, you know, it's definitely an area that people are working on understanding. So, <laughs> right. yeah. And, and the one patient and, you know, it's, well, I guess it, it, it can be in, in the, on the topic of uh, acute vertigo is um, we see uh, our second most common diagnosis is vestibular migraine. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those people are very misunderstood out in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and it can be very debilitating. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, that I see a lot of, but I don't see a lot of the literature addressing it is just their interictal hypersensitivity. Uh, I mean, these people can't do anything, you know, they can't, uh, you know, they can't go to the movies. They can't ride in the backseat. They can't do all kinds of things. Um, and there's just not a lot of attention paid to that. Uh, presentation of migraine. So, absolutely agreed. And and luckily, we've had the um, grace of having Dr. Shin Bay on to discuss vestibular migraine mm -hmm. um, last year. And we had the dizzy cook Alicia um, Wolf on a few months ago. And I think we'll do. I mean, I think it's just an area, luckily, of grow, growing literature. We're getting more and more research mm -hmm. on it. Um, and I'm happy to continue to help people. Um, you know, kind of discuss that more because, yeah, it's, it's definitely no, not a lot of people with vestibular migraine, you know, could you say, oh, these two have identical presentations. And I think that's what makes it definitely one of the reasons it's more difficult than, say, posterior canal BPV, which mm -hmm. generally presents <laughs> in a more similar fashion between patients, right? So, you know, going through this differential diagnosis, you know, we acknowledge that just going by history or patient report on symptom is not going to be enough for us to say, oh, yep, it's got to be this diagnosis just based on that. So we need to do, you know, physical exam, uh, which you can do a bedside test. We can do quantitative testing, uh, which is discussed in the article. Um, and I just want to give a little shout out to Dr. Will C. He made this very nice summary of the HINTS exam, which we're going to get into a little bit more here shortly. Um, but on Twitter, he is a, a doctor in Australia who I thought did a nice job of kind of getting the visual going. So, you know, when people are trying to learn, it's nice to have pictures as well as words to kind of try to put everything together. So with the HINTS exam, what does that mean? We'll talk through that. The head impulse test is the first piece. That's the HI portion of the HINTS. Um, so what they found with research is HINTS has a high sensitivity and specificity in detecting vestibular strokes um, when it's done by someone who is well-trained and has a good understanding of hints. Um, and uh, again, that uh, acute MRI situation just isn't identifying those at that point necessarily. So I have a nice graphic here that I pulled from an article, it looks great, shows us kind of what a, a negative head impulse test would look like on the top row, and then that positive head impulse test on the bottom row um, for those of you who don't have practice with this or want to see it more, there's lots of great videos online that I think show, you know, nice examples of the test as well as of people with a positive head impulse test and what that looks like. You want to speak a little bit to your experience with head impulse test, Dr. Desmond? Sure. Um, you know, I think it's our opportunity to look brilliant. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was doing head impulse again. I've been at this a while. 
um, long before V hit uh, existed. Um, but when you would have these patients that would come in, in the scenario that we described earlier, where they had acute vertigo, debilitating, they're in the hospital for, you, for a few days, they get imaging, they get blood tests, they get EKGs, and no one really seems to know what's going on. Um, you know, I think that's better now. I think they are, you know, getting neuro consults and ENT consults in the ER, but I'm talking, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and they're just convinced that no one is ever going to figure this out. And you walk over and boom, boom, go, oh, it's your left ear. Um, and you can be pretty certain that your testing from there on out is going to confirm that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I have found it to be an extremely helpful test. Um, and, uh, you know, having V hit, you know, I always still, I, I, I check myself against uh, every V hit. Um, anytime I get a positive V hit, I go ahead and do a manual uh, head on pulse <laughs> test, just to say if I can yeah. see what it's showing. So, um, so it's a very useful test. And I think, you know, with experience, yes. um, it's, I don't know the number, but I'm going to guess in experienced hands, uh, manual head impulse is 90% as sensitive as a V hit. I don't know if anybody studied that, but that, that would be my guess. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it does take a while. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've read the study where, and you're maybe going to get to it on a slide coming up, but uh, the study where they did uh, hints in the ER and they had ER docs and neurologists doing it. And um, the uh, ER docs didn't have nearly the sensitivity uh, that the neurologist did. So the conclusion of the study was that it's not a good test for the ER. Um, so uh, as opposed to, you know, maybe maybe some training. Um, right. But again, you know, from our vantage point, we can say, well, you should do more training, but it's one of a million things they have to know. Yes. Um, and, yes. and so, you know, when I read over this article that you're going through tonight uh, and it talks about, well, what, what's our best approach to have technology or to have remote experts? Um, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a discussion to have because asking you know, whatever the number is, you know, 20 people in every ER in the country to develop this expertise. I don't think that's going to happen. It's um, a big ask. So, <laughs> right. Um, so if there's a way that we can have uh, technology, either with, you know, machine learning or AI, or have somebody with, you know, life experience um, remotely available, um, I think you have some opportunities there. Absolutely. I totally agree. And um, I realize I might have been neglectful. For, so for those who are really just picking this up, this test is testing the peripheral vestibular system. Um, and it is testing the reflex in our inner ear, um, which we should have ideally intact on both sides. So when you move the head quickly, you're really testing that reflex. You're moving that head quickly either to center or out, depending on how you like to do the test. Uh, as long as the person doesn't know what's coming, then it's okay. Um, and you're looking for that ability of the person's eyes to stay on target even with a quick head movement. And if they can't do that, they go off target and have to jump back, that's called a corrective saccade, then that's showing um, an impaired vestibular act of reflex on the side to which you are thrusting. So if I'm thrusting right, I'm testing the right side. All right, so hopefully that catches everybody up. But it was great uh, insights there, Dr. Desmond, on the challenges of, you know, not just um, kind of understanding and interpreting a test as well as the physical skill of doing a test. There's a lot of elements. And then, of course, you know, being able to see those eye movements. And you and I know that if it's an acute vestibular neuritis or inflammation, something damaging that inner ear, it should be more obvious if it's a, kind of a corrective jump or saccade. But, you know, if it's something that's prior chronic, you know, happened years ago, um, they should not hopefully be coming with acute symptoms, but you know, it could be a, a re inflammation or something if it's like a Meniere's episode or something. So, um, anyway, if it's, it's older, I'll just say in the outpatient setting, at least it can be difficult to, to catch. And we'll talk about why video head impulse tests came about to try to help address that. Um, especially depending on, you know, again, how experienced the clinician is in, in seeing those subtle saccades. All right. So Part two of the HINTS test, moving on here, we're going to look at the N, stands for nystagmus or nystagmus. I've heard it both ways. Um, at any rate, um, it, the article did note that strokes that are smaller than one centimeter, I guess that's 
um, could be missed up to 50% of the cases within that first 24 hours. So kind of going back to that acute phase, um, you know, so we want to look for uh, what we call a spontaneous nystagmus. So the person's just sitting there, uh, hanging out, feeling terrible, <laughs> and their eyes are going, you know, some sort of direction um, with a quick beat and then a slow, slower uh, return um, in some direction. So um, there's a lot of types of nystagmus. Um, the one you'll see here in this slide is a downbeat vertical nystagmus, which almost always, in my experience, is indicative of a central or brain issue of some kind. Um, and there's a nice discussion throughout the article of visual fixation remove, which means putting them in a darkened condition, um, like vi infrared video goggles is a good example. So they're in the dark in these goggles, the infrared cameras can still see their eyes. Um, that's connected, let's say, to a cam, uh, a computer so that you can look at that computer and see the eyes in the dark and see if they're doing that nice diagnosis in the dark. Um, and the reason visual fixation is so attractive is because in room light, our brain does sometimes try to kind of suppress these eye movements, make them not visible because they're trying to help the patient the person feel better. Yes, your brain does try to help you sometimes, guys. Um, <laughs> so, you know, trying to help you out, but that doesn't help the clinician who might be trying to see those very eye movements to help with diagnosis. Um, so what types of nystagmus could we see in a peripheral issue? Um, and by the way, just to be clear, this downbeat nystagmus is not the only type you might see with central, as I like to tell my students that I'm teaching in central issues, anything goes, <laughs> except it doesn't usually follow rules. So you might see a horizontal nystagmus, you might see a torsional nystagmus, you might see a vertical upbeat nystagmus. Would you say you've seen all of those in your career that were central? I, I would say that peripheral nystagmus are very predictable in how they're going to behave to what you do in central nystagmus or not, which is so repeating back what you just said. I love it. Um, <laughs> right. Um, and, and so, you know, the idea is that if you can rule in a peripheral vestibular disorder, uh, you have effectively, you know, ruled out a stroke as the cause for the patient's presenting symptoms. Um, so I, I've seen a little bit of everything. I mean, that's a pretty intense downbeat, spontaneous <laughs> nystagmus you got going on. We made right it there. strong for the video. <laughs> right, right. Um, but you can see a little of that with migraine. Um, so it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be a, you know, a serious or life-threatening brain issue. Uh, but again, when the brain's generating nystagmus, uh, it can be almost any direction. So you can see a little vertical nystagmus when someone's in a vestibular migraine. Uh, event. Absolutely. All right. So yes, let's switch to talk about peripheral nystagmus. So that's again where, again, let's say um, um, the left ear there's been damage maybe from uh, an ear uh, an infection that has traveled to the inner ear or whatnot kind of creating inflammation in that area as an example um, and so the, I always like to say the left side isn't really talking as much <laughs> the right side's talking so this is where we get this quick beat as to the, the the good side some people would call it things like that um, is generally what you'll see does that resonate with you as well yeah, and, and the thing that I try to, to point out to our residents is that um, you know, nystagmus associated with acute peripheral uh, crisis become less intense over time. And I'm going to show you an example of that here in just a minute. But they need to understand that the nystagmus are not diminishing because the ear is healing, because the ear is getting better, but because of the cerebellar clamp process where the brain is trying to reduce the asymmetry uh, and since it can't, in, you know, in a case with uh, a left neuritis, since it can't restore function in the left, it can neurally dampen its connection to the right. So it will, over a period of two to three days, it will basically disconnect from the healthy right labyrinth, and the nystagmus will diminish to a great degree. Yep, all about those connections. I like it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I'm going to have you show your um, awesome slides of and videos in just okay. a second, but I'm going to read through okay. this slide to make sure I covered it. So we huh? know that the sensitivity of hints is reduced, according to this article at least, if AVS patients do not present with spontaneous nystagmus. Um, so it's just kind of important to note that, um, you know, it's not like one and done with this whole hints thing, I'll just say it that way, um, but it is a good tool. Um, and we do have the option, again, if we're in something like infrared video goggles, we can turn on those visual fixation lights. 
Um, and that is a way to introduce light then to a darkened environment and see if that has an impact on the nystagmus. And generally speaking, um, if you're seeing a spontaneous nystagmus, um, it's probably gonna be nice and strong in the dark. If it's peripheral sourced and you put on that light, that should diminish the strength. That may not make it go away completely, but it should diminish it. Whereas if it's from a brain issue, it's less likely or to a lesser degree will it diminish the strength of that nystagmus. Does that also uh, kind of match with your experience, Dr. Desmond? Yes. I mean, I, I will say that when I read that over, um, I thought they were making the argument that, uh, you know, that strokes, you don't see suppression, um, but they're saying you just see less suppression. So, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah, basically, if I see an if I see a nystagmus um, and I can suppress with visifixation, I, I have a little sigh of relief. For sure, for sure. All right. All right. Uh, again, cool. again, knowing that there's no rule that is 100 percent reliable. <laughs> True enough. That's that's the mm. name of all in life, I guess. But we do the best right. we can with what we got, as I like to say. Right. I'm going to switch uh, to your slides and let you um share what you okay. wanted to share screen share there okay all right so uh what i'm going to show you here is uh i am not only a uh you know vestibular clinic uh staff person but i am a patient um there we go this is about four years ago let me let's see if i can get this to play there we go. Okay, so this, is everybody seeing that? Yes. Okay, okay, so this is me uh, shortly after breakfast about uh, four <laughs> years ago. I just started spinning. I mean, I was fine and 20 seconds later, I could almost not stand up. Um, so very obvious nystagmus. Um, you know, I had the decision to go to the emergency room or not. And I decided just to self-diagnose. So I had my wife taking video of my eyes and I did my own head, head impulse. So I basically did my own self exam, but, <laughs> but those nystagmus were very obvious, um, you know, uh, left beating nystagmus that followed Alexandra's law, but just 24 hours, let's see. Okay, let me go. Okay, so just 24 hours later, there's really no nystagmus to the right. And there's still a little hint to the left, but you kind of see that because you know what you're looking for. And my guess is that would be missed on primary care exam right. more often than it would be caught. Okay. For sure. For sure. So this was at 24 hours. Uh, I still couldn't really walk unassisted at this point. Um, but I went into my office and for you VNG readers, um, this is, uh, you know, this is my Alexander's Law recording. If you look over here, um, you see my, my spontaneous nystagmus with fixation with four degrees. Without fixation, they were 13. Uh, they went up to 15 in gaze left and almost disappeared in gaze right, kind of fitting with what you saw there. But if we go to the next slide, this is what you could see under video goggles, okay? So this is, again, another 24 hours later than the previous video where there wasn't much visible. So it really does help to have the right equipment. But on the other hand, um, those nystagmus were very visible without any kind of uh, removal of fixation in that first you know, several hours anyhow. Um, all right. So, and again, for, for those of you who um, you know, want to see what happens with rotary chair and V-hit, um, if you look down here at the bottom, okay, so here's my V-hit at 48 hours, and here's to the left, okay, here's my head impulse to the left, here's my pretty reasonable accommodating eye movement to the right. Here's my head impulse to the right, and here is basically applesauce. Okay? Um, <laughs> there was there was no corrective saccades. My eye was just floating. I hadn't learned how to make a manual corrective saccade. And if you look over here, uh, my gain was almost non-existent. Yeah. If you go up to my rotational chair, my symmetry is just pegging to the right because I have pre-existing nystagmus, pre-existing left beating nystagmus, and I had a pretty significant reduction in gain. Now, if you jump ahead 16 weeks, you can see here, now this is reverse, this is the left, okay? So to the left, still pretty good, gain still pretty good, but my right ear is gone, uh, no response to the right. But if you look over here, it's not really applesauce anymore. I've got, uh, I, I've got a, what I would call an organized corrective saccade 
uh, that I've learned, my brain has learned that when I turn quickly to the right, I better start moving my eye. So my eye makes that correction very quickly in the excursion. So I spend very little time not on the target. And you can see my asymmetries can't come down. Oh, oh wrong sign. Okay. okay. Um, and it should, my asymmetries come down. Um, so, and that's mostly through lack of spontaneous nystagmus at six weeks, the spontaneous nystagmus we're going on. Yeah. Right. But, but just to get to my point of in that first um, 24 hours, um, you don't really need to remove fixation. So this is something that I've been giving out to people for quite a while um, is that, um, you know, we see a lot of patients that come in that have a history very consistent with BPV and a negative Dix Hall Pike. Um, you know, what do you do with those people? Um, so what we do is we send them home with Epley's and a camera um, and tell them, well, if you can do home Epley's for a few days and you don't get any vertigo, it either wasn't BPV or, or it's resolving or resolved. Uh, but if you do get some vertigo, let's uh, let's get some video and go ahead and send it to me. And that way I can tell them if they're doing the right exercise, if it's posterior canal or, or one of the variants. Um, and for non-positional vertigo, I basically have them do, you know, center gaze, uh, left gaze, right, um, to see if they uh, have any measurable nystagmus. So, um, you know, there have been some studies that have looked at this that showed that there's a pretty dramatic difference in nystagmus related to Meniere's disease versus migraine. Um, and since often those two um, conditions are kind of, there's a lot of overlap and they're hard to sort out, it can be very helpful to have a look at what their eyes are doing during an episode. And let's see. Um, I, I just, I, I want to throw this slide in. I have just two more things that I'm going to give the camera back up. Sure. Um, this is just a quote that, uh, you know, that I like to sort of give me patience um, is that, you know, what we're dealing with, with the hints is that the science is there. The evidence is there. It's the acceptance of the science that we're dealing with. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it, it's really a challenge of how do you present this information to, um, you know, to primary care doctors, ER doctors in a way that they will accept it, they will be willing to do it. I mean, right now, there are no real incentives for them to change what they're doing. Um, and there's not much that we can do about that. Um, but we can present this information to them in a way that they're more willing to accept. Um, you know, you can't walk into some place and say, hey, you're doing it all wrong. Let me show you how to do it. That, that's not going to fly. Um, and so with that in mind, this is something that if anybody on wants to get a copy of this, this is a sort of a guidebook for primary care, frontline um, healthcare practitioners um, seeing dizzy patients. And I won't go into it because you can read over it if you want. But if you go to the you know, Wake Forest um, Balance Disorders website and click on Balance Disorders on the right, you'll see a link to this guide. It's a 40 page guide um, and it's free to download. Um, if you do download it, just drop me an email to let me know you did it and what you think about it. And then I just have one last thing I'm going to do. Um, you know, I, I feel strongly that there should be a clinical practice guideline for acute vertigo. There is not one. Um, this is a four-part blog that I did on Hearing Health Matters about seven years ago. Um, so that'll give a little bit of background on, uh, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to be involved in the first um, clinical practice guideline for BPPV, and it was a wonderful process. Um, and I, I just feel like if the uh, different special societies got together, and worked on month or uh, acute vertigo, patients would be better, um, the doctors would be happier, uh, the people spending money on healthcare would be happier. Uh, so it's something that I think has to happen, but I'm not sure what it's gonna to take to make it happen. So I'm going to stop sharing there. All right, well, that that's awesome, helpful. I love it. Um, yeah, so everybody take advantage, first of all, of that. Uh, practical guide and maybe share it with some doctors. And then um, while you're at it, uh, maybe we can start building a little momentum amongst the vestibular community to help support um, so that if Dr. Desmond can see the clinical practice guidelines in his lifetime, which I know he has a lot of years left, but still, let's do this, guys, because seven years ago he wrote that. That's not a good sign for us getting there yet. So, uh, yeah, put that in your... Uh, you're looking for a project. There it is. <laughs> um, and Dr. Desmond would definitely uh, support and help with that for sure. 
Um, so I feel compelled to finish the article, so I'm going to do that. Um, so we'll move on, uh, but that was really helpful. Uh, test of skew here, just want to address that briefly. So it's pictured here on the slide, uh, covering one eye and um, removing it. And there's also where you can do cross cover, things like that. You're just looking for um, an eye misalignment. Um, so you know, typically that would be associated with a central uh, issue, a brain issue. Um, however, there was a recent study that I felt like I should uh, acknowledge. Um, this was pointed out to me uh, by a doctor in Germany. Um, you'll see him listed there, his Twitter um, handle, at vertigoologist. And um, what this article mentioned is that they were finding in this group of, I think, like 50 patients. So it wasn't a huge number. I like to see, you know, bigger numbers, but, you know, Research is always ongoing, hopefully. Um, and they found that there was a skewed deviation in every fourth patient with acute unilateral vestibulopathy in their study. So um, they did find that the degree of skew was pretty mild in those folks, whereas large skew deviations, and they were measuring them um, greater than 3.3 degrees on VOG or VNG, um, pointed toward a central lesion. So it just kind of doesn't mean that the test of skew is without value in my opinion, but I think just kind of being aware um, that you shouldn't just use the test of skew to make your decisions, which hopefully we're doing more than that as we sort out this, these, diagnos these diagnoses. Uh, I, there was a discussion in hint, on hints plus in this article, so I wanted to acknowledge that as well. Um, and essentially the plus piece is this kind of acute hearing loss question, and is that a possible sign of a central um, issue. Um, so they talk about a finger rub test. Um, unfortunately, the article does mention that's a low specificity since the produced sound pressure level is very low. Um, so I'd like you to maybe as an audiologist speak to this if you would and tell me, do you think Hints Plus is valuable? What's your personal experience, if any, et cetera? Yeah, well, I, I, I think this is helpful for people with labyrinthitis, but, you know, I would think, um, you know, a, a finger rub test or, or something like that just to identify whether the person thinks they hear better out of one or the other, and, and then a uh, tuning fork, Weber, um, would, would be probably helpful. But uh, if I was going to design a hints plus, the plus would be Dick's Hall Pike testing. Um, so, um, you know, that that's would be the logical thing if you don't... Um, you know, if you don't have a positive head impulse test um, and you don't have spontaneous nystagmus, then go ahead and do a Dick's Hall Pike test. There's a great uh, video by Peter Johns. I think you mm -hmm. mentioned him right there. Uh, he's yes. great. Uh, <laughs> he really uh, is. <laughs> yeah, so he, he, he has a video. He's an ER doc um, out of Toronto, I think. Uh, and he has a series of YouTube videos and he, he gets it. Um, and he has one on when you should do the hints and when you should do positionals. And... Uh, it, it's mandatory watching in our department. So. Excellent. No, I, I highly uh, recommend his YouTube uh, channel as well. It's, it's fantastic, very well explained videos. Um, but yes, he has one from which I took the screenshot that does explain what the Hints Plus exam is and kind of what would make you think that person might have a central issue that you should, you know, then go on to examine further with whatever would be appropriate, say neuroimaging or whatnot. So I uh, just want to give him that props there for me letting uh, me kind of grabbing that <laughs> screenshot there to kind of indicate that. So um, video impulse tests we've talked about a little bit already since you yourself have had <laughs> a few. Um, just to kind of make sure everybody's on the same page, it involves a camera with a sort of goggle of sorts the person can see um, sort of looking at a target they're trying to keep their eyes fixed on that target similar to the traditional head impulse test where you have them usually fixate on your nose and move their head uh, quickly in this case they're fixating on an external target because you're behind them you're moving their head quickly uh, again and um, this case the camera is recording the eyes looking for those corrective saccades and giving us data um, from the eye tracking and um, they have found that it is helpful, very helpful, with a sensitivity of 88%, a specificity of 92%. Essentially, you want um, a positive head impulse test would be it's peripheral, yay. Uh, the negative head impulse test on both sides, 
um, and acute vestibular syndrome, we're looking at, uh, you know, much more likely to be some sort of central issue and often uh, uh, we'll call it a, a, a stroke of some kind. So this is not as pretty as yours, but this is <laughs> kind of no applesauce here, but there's definitely some abnormalities. Um, on the left there in this case, this is from Dr. Haynes' site. He's got so much great information on his site, uh, dizziness and balance. And um, just, you know, again, kind of reiterating, this is really to identify if someone has unilateral or bilateral, that does occur as well, um, vestibular loss, which could be partial or very occasionally complete, in which case they wouldn't be dizzy. <laughs> um, did, you, did you say you see a lot more partials, if you will, on the bilaterals than you do completes? Uh, what do you mean by partial? I mean, like, um, so when I have somebody who's dizzy, even if they have positive impulse tests bilaterally, they still, I guess, maybe on, I don't know if it'd be calorics or what, that they have some sort of, like, they give us percents from the reports, uh, the VNG reports on, you know, kind of, mm -hmm. you know, there's kind of the difference between the two and also if they think, you know, there's right. some residual function. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, and, and, and I think it's, it is important for people doing vestibular testing to understand that, you know, V-HIT is not a substitute for calorics. It's, it's an alternative. Um, the way I look at them, because we don't do that many calorics anymore because we have a rotary chair in V-HIT. Um, you know, not everybody has, has the luxury of having that. But, um, you know, I look at it, if you want to do a test to establish asymmetric vestibular function, and you want it to be at, you know, a physiologic or an aphysiologic speed, um, you know, V-HIT will help you lateralize the vestibular dysfunction very quickly and painlessly for the patient, uh, where calorics, it's, you know, <laughs> it takes a long time and, and, and no one likes it. Um, it's not a substitute, but, but, but we, my colleague and I did an article, it's in audiology today, about two years ago on, on this topic about uh, how vibration and uh, V-HIT really allows you to not have to do uh, calorics very often. I know you did a um, journal uh, club on vibration and it's a great test. I, I hope it catches on. Very simple. Me too. Me too. I talk about it whenever I get the chance because I find mm -hmm. it very handy. Again, it's not the only test I do, but I do find it to be very helpful. Uh, but for the sake of this, since the article doesn't discuss vibration, we'll, we'll hit mm. this up. So basically, in this case, they do talk about the issue with artifacts, which is true you know, of any eye tracking um, and that operator is definitely important when we're doing these kind of tests. And um, they indicated, they observed as the authors, that after 160 head impulse tests, they felt like uh, <laughs> someone could, you know, do it in the way that the V-HIT system, you know, would, would not get as many artifacts. So that was interesting to me. That's not an insurmountable amount of practice, but it's certainly more than the 10 or 20 that some might be inclined to say, okay, I got this. <laughs> um, so just kind of noting that um, as a mild barrier, I suppose, you have to get that practice in. Uh, so video nystagography, I wanted to address that briefly. This is where we're, again, putting infrared goggles most likely on the eyes, and then we're using eye tracking software to get data. So the article covers kind of example of, a you know, kind of, types of nystagmus you might see in someone with a, a stroke versus someone with vestibular neuritis and uh, also kind of talks about kind of the um, kind of intensity and that it's generally less strong in someone with a stroke um, and uh, you've already shown us a nice video of some nystagmus but uh, we can kind of play this while uh, we talk here so um, would you also say that in your practice, you've generally seen a stronger intensity in someone with an acute, um, unilateral vestibulopathy as compared to, um, those with stroke? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, it, but it's a different pattern. I mean, you know, I don't worry so much about intensity because that changes so quickly over time. Um, but it, to me, if it's, um, direction changing, I get worried. If it's uh, direction fixed, I'm comfortable that we're dealing with a, a peripheral issue. Perfect. And to give uh, props for this video, which just was showing a nice right beating nystagmus, left 
hypofunction there, most likely our left neuritis they list here. That's Dr. Sanders, Scott Sanders. He has some great eye videos on YouTube as well. He's out of Indiana, which is my home state. So double props to him for that uh, video there. There we go. So, um, you know, they do talk about in this article, uh, again, this kind of suppression um, of spontaneous distinguish, which we have covered. And um, they actually kind of quantified it a little bit and said a reduction in nystagmus of less than two degrees in light um, is predictive of stroke. So you're gonna kind of that put on the light, you might see a little bit of suppression, but not nearly as much um, as when you go from dark to light in someone with peripheral uh, nystagmus. So they do talk about video test of skew and the challenges in doing that. Um, they still seem to kind of in their dream list at the end of the article say, <laughs> we'd like this to be quantified so that they could maybe kind of indicate that 3.3, .3, I think, degrees that it was. It was kind of helpful all in differentiating uh, a skew that seemed strongly likely to be central as opposed to those who have a peripheral vestibulopathy who might have a mild skew. Um, so, you know, pros and cons, I think this was kind of one of those, oh, we hope the technology will come along or we'll sort out a better way to do it at some point. Have you ever done a video test of SKU? Is that something you're familiar with? I, no, I, I have not. Um, test of SKU is not really part of my evaluation process. If I have a patient that comes in with, you know, pre-existing no diplopia, I'll go ahead and do it just to try to keep my skills up for when, for when I might need it. Um, but no, I don't think I can really offer much on that. Yeah, and, and that's, a, you know, luckily for me uh, in outpatient physical therapy, I, I don't get a lot of positive tests of skew. They're usually coming in, uh, you know, again, unless it's some sort of known cerebellar stroke that that was part of their presentation and hasn't resolved, um, then I might see it, but that's not the majority of my patients either, but had to give a nod to it from the article. So this article goes into a whole section on kind of AI and the idea of how can we get data from these different tests like video head impulse test or, you know, VNG and start to get um, a, an automated response on what is a possible diagnosis uh, or kind of what, you know, they're seeing in a more kind of quantitative way. Again, kind of really recommending some quantitative data uh, to help fill in the gap for those who don't have expertise. Um, but they do acknowledge that essentially, you know, these tests are not perfect. And so, you know, again, that kind of issue of artifact comes up. Um, so if you don't have somebody who can kind of say, oh, <laughs> that's not what you think it is, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, that definitely uh, is discussed here. So w what are your two cents on that? Well, uh, somebody in the room has to know what they're doing. Um, but I can see where, and this is something, I don't know if you remember Rick Miles from Micromedical, he's retired now, but he and I used to talk about this. And I actually had him um, build a unit for me. It was basically a primary care BNG unit. And it met the minimum requirements of what Medicare required to do gay spontaneous and positional. Um, mm -hmm. so, you could, so you could measure it and you could print it and you could bill it, hopefully in inspiring, you know, primary care doctors to, to do those tests. Um, but we talked about that it wouldn't be that difficult to have the computer say, oh, this is a left beating nystagmus in head left or whatever, and say, this could be consistent with such and such. And, you know, if you lay someone down and they're both horizontal and vertical recording, you know, that's consistent with posterior canal. If it's just horizontal, it might say, you know, raise the patient up, do a lateral roll test. Um, if it's perfectly, if it's all vertical, say, hmm, this could be um, anterior canal. Um, so there's ways to do this. This is not beyond technology means. It's what will be the uptake on it? You know, who will, who will use this? Yes, because... Why would they not use it? Why wouldn't they want to be able to help these patients with dizziness? Good question. <laughs> no. no easy no. answers on that one, huh? <laughs> well, you know, I, I say, you know, a little bit what we talked earlier about is, you know, I've talked to many ER people 
Um, and there's not really any incentive for them to change what they're doing. Um, there's, uh, you know, a little bit of a disincentive, you know, um, you know, if you look at, you know, what, what is, uh, you know, best practice versus standard of care, they often conflict with each other. I mean, standard of care is this is what most people do. Um, and there is no requirement that it be effective. It's just that, well, other people do this. So if I do it, I'm okay. Um, and so, you know, I've had uh, ER doctors say, you know, I, because I talked to them about why are you ordering CT scans on these people? I mean, this is not the appropriate test. Um, and the response that I got was that, and from, from more than one, is that, um, you know, I, I worry about strokes. I don't worry about peripheral inner ear problems. Um, and, you know, I'm never going to get sued for missing a peripheral inner ear problem. So I really want to make sure that I'm not missing a stroke. And when I try to point out that, well, CT scans don't do that as well as an eye exam. Um, some of them listen and some of them, you know, um, some of them feel like they've got their tools and aren't really looking for any more tools. Fair enough. Yeah, it's, it's definitely complicated as far as, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about training in a second here, because that is something we, you touched on already. Um, you know, the, the conclusion of this article uh, states that um, you know, things like the HINTS exam are highly effective um, in the hands of some specialists. And um, when you have someone who's not, you know, as experienced performing it, there's just room for error of various types. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, uh, you know, knowing that this technology has a, an opportunity to perhaps allow a subspecialist who's remote to you know kind of view the data or view the testing and and kind of have you know them make the interpretation identify maybe an artifact or whatnot so they can make sure things are on track um it sounds good but how do we put it in place so um you know how much of it should be oh we should train everyone better and i know the baronet society has put out um, some recommendations on kind of what should be included for physician training on vestibular um, topics. Um, are you familiar with that as, as well? That came out fairly recently, I think it was. I don't think I've seen that, no. Yeah, yeah. So it just, it kind of made some recommendations, you know, because historically, you know, physicians get very little on vestibular um, <laughs> topics in school um, for the same issue of it, you know, well, the heart attack's going to kill them. The peripheral ear issue just makes them feel mm -hmm. bad, right? So this kind of prioritization, which I completely respect, <laughs> um, you know, but just kind of, they make some arguments in the article, um, of the Baronet's recommendations for education about, you know, you know, why it should be more prioritized. So we'll see where it goes, um, as far as in the academic settings. I think one of the, um, things that stood out most in this article, um, and, and I, I don't know how it couldn't stand out to anybody is that the rate of, um, CT scanning went from 49% to 2%, uh, simply by virtue of having someone with some training do that initial assessment. And in a fee-for-service uh, healthcare system, that is not necessarily super attractive to the person running the ER because they're not losing money by doing all those CT scans. Uh, but in a capitated system where you know, you're trying to provide cost-effective care, uh, that's, that's a huge number. So that is an opportunity. There's a great opportunity here. Absolutely. Totally agree. All right. So we're very close to our hour here. I wanted to point out some excellent resources uh, that were inspired uh, to me uh, by uh, this talk. One is, you know, Dr. John, Peter John's um, YouTube, which you've already mentioned. So feel free to check that out if you haven't already, if you want to learn more on those topics. Um, nice pathologic eye videos. Um, the University of Utah has done a great job. Um, Dr. Newman Toker, who's done a ton of work on hints, so we have to acknowledge him and his team at Johns Hopkins, uh, as well as Dr. Gold has so many eye videos on there, and he is one of the authors on this article, so appreciate those. And then Dr. Desmond, of course, um, in addition to the uh, resources that he's already mentioned himself on his slides, uh, he does have a book um, and vestibular function. I highly recommend you check that out if you have interest. And then, of course, um, you might have heard him mention hearinghealthmatters.org. 
Um, he has tons of vestibular rated articles. I just saw one that you did, I think, in May uh, 2022 on vestibular migraine. Um, so, you know, it's kind of good to keep up to date and hear from a variety of perspectives. And there's no question that Dr. Desmond, with his uh, extensive experience and, you know, a really great perspective as an audiologist, um, you know, I love to hear from different clinicians, not just fellow PTs as much as I love physical therapy. So uh, I really appreciate uh, the insights that you, you have in these articles. So we are ready to open it up to questions. Just a few minutes for those. And uh, while we're waiting for some to come in here, uh, Dr. Desmond, um, any kind of things you definitely want to say before we wrap up that your parting thoughts. Oh, I wish I would have said this. Um, now is your chance, or I can just come up with another clinical question if you prefer. <laughs> um, the only, the only thing, uh, just a, a little sort of clinical pearl that I, I, because again, I understand that having, you know, all the bells and whistles makes my job easier than people who don't have that. Um, so I would just suggest to anybody that if they get a patient that has um, bilateral reduced calorics, um, while you've got them there laying on the table, just roll their head back and forth at a moderate speed. And uh, if you see some nystagmus you know, following their head movement, they have, I can't say it's normal, but they have higher frequency VOR function. The majority of people who have no response to calorics have, I wouldn't say normal, but significantly useful higher frequency VOR function. So just a, just a clinical pearl to throw it in. I love those clinical pearls. All right, I see uh, comments and questions coming in here. So we have Nicole Lim. I don't see a lot of positive tests of SKU, um, and only when she's working inpatient neuro, which makes sense. Um, and then another comment here, ED doctors are getting better at doing hints now with more awareness. Offering PT in the ED would help a lot for accuracy of this diagnosis as well. Um, do you have some experience with uh, PTs in the ED? Uh, yes. It, yes. Um, we have a neuro PT department, uh, here at Wake. They're fabulous. Um, I almost think that, uh, they don't need me around because they're so good. Um, but, um, when, what, what I see is when PT gets called into the ED, they just kind of follow the pre-existing diagnosis. Um, so, you know, I don't see them doing their own independent exam. Um, and so I would say that I, I would think that it, it, just because you get a, a referral for somebody with suspected BPPB, don't, don't believe it until you see it. <laughs> okay. Amen. Amen uh, on that one. <laughs> right. Um, so, so that's the only thing I would add there. Um, so yeah. Great. Um, and I think this question here also echoes a question I had maybe in a slightly different way. It asks, what testins, tests do you think can be easily implemented in the ED for vestibular triage? And with that, I would say, you know, let's say, you know, as, as, as optimistic as this article is, if you don't have V hit and you don't have a full VNG system in the ED, you know, we're, we're walking in, let's say, as a physical therapist who's, who has good vestibular training and is happy to do their own exam, um, you know, and I do know a few PTs out there doing that, I will say. And, uh, you know, what, what might they want to have in their toolbox? I mean, knowledge is number one, but let's say they've got that going. You know, what, what kind of couple more, we'll say, accessible, portable, uh, affordable, you know, tools might they want to have? Well, I would say the first thing um, that, that Hintz doesn't talk about, which I think is very important, is... Um, you know, I, I have a slide that I show our residents that uh, say, what's wrong with this picture? And it shows a doctor sitting there in a, still in his white coat and the patient sitting in the exam chair and none of them can ever figure out what's wrong with that picture. And I tell them what's wrong is they're both sitting down. Um, when you get someone that comes in with acute vertigo, you've got to get them up and walk them and, uh, and, and see if they can walk. And if somebody can't walk unassisted, I mean, even somebody in acute vestibular crisis you know, you might have to hold their hand, but their gait appears normal. Uh, but if you have someone who's just pitching side to side, I just would assume that's a stroke until, I, I, even if the imaging was negative, I would still suggest admitting that patient. Um, so that's a tool. Um, but as far as, um, you know, what, uh, when we're talking about tools, we're talking about exams or like, 
things that you buy. Uh, I well, would say whatever that, you recommend, we'll take it all. Okay. <laughs> well, well, obvi obviously, I think having a pair of goggles in the ER. Uh, goggles are not expensive. It doesn't take a lot of training to put goggles on somebody and say, look left, look right, um, to determine if there's any spontaneous nystagmus. Um, and so, you know, look for spontaneous nystagmus. Um, do a head impulse or a V hit if you have the equipment. If you don't have V hit, you will get better at head impulse. And then do a Dix Hall pipe because patients are terrible at describing their symptoms. Um, you know, if someone comes in and says, oh, I've been spinning for, you know, the last 24 hours, you know, the first question would be, are you spinning every second? Can you find any position to make it stop? And the majority of those people will tell you, yeah, you know, if I can, if I can get my head in just the right position, I can make it stop. But if I move, um, and, and so, you know, and I know earlier I was making the argument that people with acute vestibular <laughs> syndrome will be diagnosed with BPPV, uh, but this is where the skill comes in. Um, and so, um, you know, do a Dix Hall Pike. If you don't see anything that gives you an answer during your HINTS exam, do a Dix Hall Pike. Yeah, and I would like to add roll test because it doesn't take that much longer and then you're not going to miss that horizontal right, canal. Right, right, right. But I think what you I, mean is positional testing and I completely agree. You want to make sure you cover agree. those bases. Um, very good. All right. Well, uh, we are definitely a teeny bit over time, but I think it was well worth it. Uh, Dr. Desmond, this hour flew by for me. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the well, time. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you everyone else for watching, listening in, and uh, we look forward to our next the Journal Club in July. Until then, take care. Good night, all. <laughs>